Because it's that Spot wanting on. other people to uh, validate Gold Star and condone the thing is what makes people not have the courage. Correct. Mm -hmm. Back to the French word, right? Cur. So it's like <laughs> bravery to tell the truth of your own heart is really what courage is. Mm. So first of all, thank you all for being here. This is very exciting. I mean, Franklin, you just you gave us a chunk of time in the middle of your busiest week uh -oh, a thank year. Thank you, thank you. So I'm very excited about that. And Jason, you too. And Reva had a show last night, so how epic. Um, and the reason I asked the three of you to be in this episode of The Fiction of Limitation is because when I was writing the book, when I got to the rainbow chapter, which was important to me to show that we don't all just have to live in one experience. We don't have to live in this happy or in this joyful, or this successing, that and when we lean into all the truths of ourselves, that's when we actually thrive. And the three of you are just the embodiment of that to me for, for multiple different reasons, but most importantly, because you're all pioneers in different ways. You've all lived a life and continue to live a life that's your own way, even if no one else gets it, or no one else sees it, or no one else understands it. And that's a superpower in itself. And uh, starting with you, I met you, you were a second old, <laughs> literally. Um, and um, I love that you, we, we were, you were so loved that you had all these nicknames. And I remember the first time you introduced yourself to the Sharif. I don't know if you saw him last night. I did. Yeah, he's, you said, uh, he said, well, what is your name? And you said, my name is Riva Nairi Esther Pumpkin Frisell. And that really embodies who you are because you are all of those people and all of those names, but as one. Mm. I remember being in Brooklyn, you were four years old. We were in a, a bodega, and the woman gave me a little bit of attitude, and you sucked your teeth. <laughs> it felt like for 25 minutes. <laughs> and at that moment, I thought, oh, right, you are literally the embodiment of who you are, and you've never changed. And that's, that's amazing. And as I see you grow and blossom more and more into this really unique um, combination of gifts of music and dance and song and creativity but also really secretly teaching people mm. a lineage that's ancient, a spiritual divin divination that we don't know we hold and making it just sexy. <laughs> it was a big inspiration for me writing this book. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> and you, Jason. <laughs> yeah, good. Let's get lots of tears. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, you've been, I keep saying my ambassador of Quan. I keep saying that from Jerry Maguire. Because every time I've gotten to a place where I've just made cemented myself into the successing moment, mm -hmm. you've always been there to turn me back around and say, maybe this way, or maybe look at that, or open up. And I, I was thinking yesterday that so many amazing people in my life, like Franklin, I knew through you. And you came into my life at a time where we were in the industry, in the music industry. Mm -hmm. And as a black person in the music industry, there was only one way. And both of us got a lot of flack for that, not mm -hmm. choosing to just be in the black music department, not choosing to just love one genre not choosing to just be successful in music and not branch out into other ideas. And you've always done that and you've always listened to your heart and you've always come at that place where almost like there is no limitation. And that's not just a unique thing for a brown man in America, you know, but mm -hmm. it's also a unique thing for someone in the industries you choose, sometimes the friend groups you choose, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the way you move around the world. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been a, a massive inspiration to me and I don't think I'd be here if I hadn't ha had those examples from you all. Thank you. And then, I, my mom, my mom used to say hard head, soft butt. And I like to say open heart, soft butt. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm here for the soft butt. <laughs> and the open heart. I'm sorry. And then one of those examples was one day you called me and said, you're in LA? Well, we have to meet Franklin. He's a good friend of mine. And of course, like Jason, no other information. <laughs> we get to the LACMA Museum and you all, you know, all know that I'm obsessed with art and museums. And then you introduced me to Franklin, who is just bigger than life in such a real way. I don't know if that makes sense. Like mm. all this artistic knowledge, all of this accreditation of, of gifts, but really it was your passion of showing us the, the beauty and the art and the things that you created and you had a hand in in this massive institution. You made it feel like we were there on our own private play date mm. as friends. And even coming to the PAM, I think I told you that after the pandemic, Every museum I went to had their one black thing because, you know, it was trendy. <laughs> it's true. <clears throat> and it was cute. And I appreciate it. You know, Fabiola Jean, so I'm mm -hmm. saying it right, at the Met, I love, is a great friend of Nairi's. Mm -hmm. And so proud to the Met. But when I came to, to, to this museum and you had, you had really made a dedication of service to the not just brown art from around the world, 
but the complexities and the differences and the real beauty of each of their message coming from the lineage they came from and then the soup that they were in here. And mm. that, that, that's not just brilliance. That's a love and an empathy for being in the artist experience. And I think that's what I'm really saying, that the combination that the three of you have of people who listen to your own heart, gu are guided by your own GPS, mm. but also do massive things in the world, but are also always teaching is really the only recipe for the way we can go in the future. Mm. So I'd love to hear from each of you what that means to you, how you got here, and um, yeah, and how, how do you feel you embody that? You want to start, Franklin? Well, I mean, I'm just, um, thank you for your words, for your guidance, for the way that you move about the world, because that's why, obviously, that's why we're here. Um, and having you in in our lives in that way, I think, is, is um, you know, is the importance of this moment. So thank you for having me. Um, I don't know, there's so many different like ways through through that question. I have my, my simple um, cliches in that I kind of grew up with a duality of art and creativity versus upward mobility and wanting to um, embody <laughs> the Booker T. Washington ideals of up from slavery. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, and I still feel like we're all guided by that to some degree. We're not in a place in this country or anywhere in the world, I would say for that matter, where we cannot, where we have the um, good fortune to forget about where we come from um, in the most challenging senses of the word. And so I think that's what, you know, it's what, what, what part of this conversation is about is the ability to on one hand, balance that necessity versus something that is different, something that is um, unique, something that is endemic, I think, to each one of us. Um, for me personally, it's, it's always been about that balance. In a cliched way, I had seen a lot of, um, a lot of artists that we would look up to, abstract painters in particular, and grew up around that. And um, my cliche is that I saw Jean-Michel Basquiat on the cover of the New York Times Magazine in February 1985 when we were in high school. And, uh, you know, he had on this, this, this Armani suit and no shoes and, and it was text behind him and color behind him. And it was just the confluence of everything. And to, I don't think it's possible to understate the uh, effect of of, of being born around the time we were born and being a part of what would come to be known as hip hop in some degree and trying to find yourself within that. So I don't know. There, <laughs> yeah. We could begin there, but there's a lot of different um, things that bring us here today. And just to highlight what you're saying, I mean, what I received is that you were in high school and you were already kind of looking for something. And then you, this visual happened that turned you around because it was something bigger and more full and had more depth and also was speaking to the things that you were feeling was a deficit in the world at large. Absolutely. Mm. Which beautiful. is, which is the same today as I mean, you know, as we try to figure out how to be better humans, as you, as you mentioned, like leading with joy and seeing what is in people uh, and finding the bridges between us rather mm. than the divides between. Absolutely. Yes. For me, so different. Uh, the first thing I heard in, in Frank describing that moment was the New York Times Magazine which was not in my home, ironically <laughs> enough. And I would probably say my friends were probably the biggest influence of which Frank was and, and is a dear one. Uh, we grew up together and it was actually going to places like his home hmm. where there was black art on the wall and also where his dad had a penchant for cars. Hmm. And, um, and he had three of the same kind of car had three 911s, which was like- Hold on, tell everybody what 911s are a car aficionado. If, if you should know about cars, a 911 is, is the definition of, of sports and, and luxury, 911 Porsche. Oh. Um, he had three, so- In different colors? Yeah. Yes, okay. and one target top, one hard top, one convertible. It was, so right. it was just, it was, it was like, okay, one is enough. Like it's, it's enough. It, it, it just created this moment of ambition. But after the, after knowing he had one, that he had two and three, it's like, oh, there's a specificity mm. in this is, mm. this is, this is a, a, a worship of an auto, automobile or beauty in a certain kind of way. And I saw past 
the fact that he could afford to do it, but mm. the fact that he could afford to do what he wanted to do mm. with what he had. Mm. That was so powerful. And as you know, I love cars. And <laughs> I've owned three or four cars at three or four. different points, which is bananas. But um, uh, yeah, we're seeing a, a man of color um, in, in the town in which we lived live that loud. That was, mm. it was really powerful to me. And this was at a time where most upward to uh, middle, middle to upper class black folks were, you know, my parents were Cadillac and Lincoln people. They, they weren't <laughs> poor people yet. And I was like, I want a BMW. They were like, you ain't getting nothing. Um, so uh, yeah, I, it, was, it was my friends and their, and, and, and their legacies. And, and Frank brought up um, Booker T. Washington. Jeez, I don't think I read about <laughs> black writers and knew about black writers until senior year in high school um maybe mm -hmm. junior year with miss archer mm -hmm. um we had we, ironically enough we had a white black <laughs> studies teacher who was amazing. <laughs> she was amazing and she would talk to these to these you know we were we were first generation yeah. um first generation integration kids so yeah. she assumed our parents taught us about all these different people and i would sit in that class and be like I don't know about any of this. She was like, baby, you don't know about Baldwin? <laughs> oh my God, we're gonna get you. And she got me a bunch of Baldwin books and was like, you need to read those. And um, and I thought it was for assignments, but mm. it wasn't. She mm. was just like, I'll never ever forget her. Mm -hmm. um, so just this being ushered into a legacy, not through just stories, but through osmosis mm -hmm. almost. Um, a legacy of achievement of 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 overcoming obstacles and then if you manage to do that you can live on your own terms right. you don't have to live with anyone's boundaries of um of of who of you and and, and who you are and then the, the one other thing i want to say about it is uh when i was I, I was in elementary school and we had a big house and a pool in the backyard and two of my friends came over to swim. They were two white kids. Mm -hmm. And um and we were horsing around and you know doing what boys do. And I guess it got a little rough and one one got held under a little too long and he came up and he called me a mm -hmm. you know bad word. <laughs> um, and uh and I had never heard it before. Mm. I didn't know what it meant. Mm. Because I grew up in, you know, before New Rochelle, I was in Harlem and mm -hmm. it was just it was Puerto Ricans, Jews, you know, some Dominicans, it was everyone, and no one called each other anything because we were all striving to be better. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know what the word meant. And my brother heard it. And he made me get out of the pool and he scolded me and said, Don't ever let anyone call you that. And then told them they have to leave. So, you know, mm -hmm. as I got older, you know, that word is like radioactive, it's toxic, but it's never felt that way to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's because the context in which it happens. Wait, you're in my backyard, right, swimming in my right. pool, mm -hmm. and you got thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> I did. You got. You had the nerve to say something that you knew was bad, and I didn't. And you got thrown out. So that word and and and, and all that comes with it. It never. It never held me back in a mm -hmm. way. It never. That's it never gross. shrunk me. Um, so yeah, that felt important to mention too. I, mm -hmm. I love that. And mm -hmm. also what I get out of that though is from the stories you've you've said already is you kind of came loaded, like I talk about Ms. Riva here, <laughs> both of you with this this kind of penchant for looking for the unordinary mm. and being open to yeah. seeing what's not being seen. Mm. And that I want to get into more as we talk. But yeah, you definitely came embodying that. And and also what's interesting about you is that you've taken, you know, you you've been ra you were raised in Haiti. And then you came to New York for high school, and then you just created a career for yourself that really out of your butt. You know what I mean? Like the concept <laughs> of soft butt. Yeah, yeah, your soft butt. <laughs> just because you know, even the even the influences that that I know you have, you know, like um, I just forget Isabel's mom's name. It's horrible. Luniz. Luniz. Thank you. I'll never forget again. So, so did you ever feel that that was a challenge, or did did you feel supported and always leaning into that? Um, well, I want to say first, thank you yes. for all of the beautiful things that you've said and just you also, how, how you were saying before, just like you've been such an inspiration. You've, you've always lived exactly in your truth and no matter what that looks like and how it feels to everyone outside, you've always just been you. And I've always, you know, you're my big sister. So you're my number one, like inspiration. Um, and so I think 
a big part of my uh, blossoming into myself has been support. You know, it's so important to have your tribe around you love and support and sort of like uplift you in whatever it is that you're doing. So thank you for that. Um, but yes, growing up in Haiti um, was, is uh, the biggest part of um, who I am now. Um, so like heritage is really important, spirituality, culture, preservation of all those things, educating, and then also modernizing it and, and making it sexy, how you said. Yeah. Um, but I feel that because I'm of mixed descent, um, because I'm of mixed race, because I'm half um, white and half Haitian, I feel that it it made me a, li a bit more... Um, open since it, in Haiti to explore more as sort of like an insider outsider, mm. if that makes sense. Completely. Mm. Like I was in ceremony sort of like as a tourist kind mm -hmm. of vibe because mommy was a tourist to, uh, in the country. And so she would take me to all of these sacred spaces, whereas my peers who may ha have been born and raised on the land have never been to those spaces. Mm -hmm. So I grew up watching Lunis perform Every week, mm -hmm. I learned all the songs. I loved the dances. It was in me already. Um, and so from a very young age, I immediately like found what I, you know, what moves me, like the colors, the, all of the, all of the Haitian voodoo culture is like all of it. The melodies, the colors, the food, like everything, the herbs, um, the sacred uh, spaces, the, all the different lakus that we have in Haiti, all of those things are just like really inspiring to me. Um, and so, yes, I moved here as a teenager, which is a tough time to be relocated because, you know, to really root yourself in your identity, it gets a little bit shaky if you're uprooted and then now you're like, I'm a mixed girl in a um, mm -hmm. in in Manhattan and at the Fame School. I went to LaGuardia and I never really found. I was an incoming sophomore, so I never found like my click, if you will. Um, and so you know, I found other other inspirations during those times. I leaned into jazz music and learned a lot about jazz during that time. Mm -hmm. And I you know joined gospel choir and and all of those things are are beautiful to me as well. Um, but it wasn't until um, college wh where I went in New Orleans and the music director mm. there was um, <laughs> from <laughs> Haiti. <laughs> <laughs> um, the music director was from Haiti and um, he wanted to arrange these traditional voodoo songs with an orchestra and he wanted me to sing them. Mm -hmm. And I just thought like, what? Like I've never seen that done before can you do that? Like, is it allowed? Is it okay? Mm. You know, because people are so sensitive about doing things a certain way and not changing it and not, you know, leaving it as is because anyways, that's a whole nother debate. Like <laughs> in terms of preservation, like are we preserving it if we modify it, mm. you know, to adjust right. with the times? Um, so I learned a lot of songs during that time, during my time in New Orleans and fell in love in a different way with um, how to approach the songs. And then um, when I moved back to New York after school, when Priva, my dad passed away, it felt like, okay, now I'm pressed for time to like really decide which way I wanna go. And I felt like I need to create a project that is dedicated to, th to this type of music, to, to my ancestors, to the spirits, to give this to them as, a, as an offering. And then sort of everything, you know, um, came from that. I, I did my first album, that was in like 2014. Wow. Um, and then everything, I, I created a dance class after that because um, I felt that the dance classes in New York that I attended were all very much, um, you know, dance based and not breaking down like the different rhythms with the different deities and the different elements and the different colors. So I teach a class now that is very much um, structured um, around like education and it's open level and it's not really about dance. It's more about understanding the roots of the folkloric movements. Um, and then I created the events that I throw that you've been to many, um, which are voodoo themed um, events because 
so many people in the diaspora of Haitian descent or any, um, you know, West Indian, African descent, um, they are often intimidated by like a voodoo ceremony. So they don't attend or, but so I created this, these events to sort of open the gates and They're make amazing. it, um, uh, make it fun and make it um, educational. And, and, and people are learning uh, unknowingly, like, okay, we're serving these, these dishes for this particular event, but all of, you know, the whole menu is curated for, for that particular spirit because that's what they would want to be fed. Mm -hmm. And so we're drinking this, you know, cocktail that was crafted specifically. So it's like a way to, you know, um, subliminally just share all that information. Um, so I'm excited to keep building upon that and, um, and, and partner and, and I just, it's, it wasn't done before in that way. And I see it more happening now with um, in the Haitian community and everywhere I mm -hmm. see people doing more um, events that are a bit more out of the box and, and a bit more voodoo inspired. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that. And I feel like it's okay. And it's just that there's so, there's so much stigmatism and it's just such a taboo topic, especially mm -hmm. for Haiti being the first free black nation, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. the fact that there was a voodoo ceremony that happened before the revolution happened mm -hmm. and that really, you know, sh set things off. It's just, it's such a a topic that's not discussed enough. Like even, um, you know, just getting people to talk about it more. Um, and so to answer your question, <laughs> it has been challenging, um, but I feel like that this is my purpose and that's what I'm, this is what I'm here for is if, and, and, and it resonates with those that it's supposed to resonate with. And I feel, you know, that a lot of people um, have learned a lot and have taken away and, and have been inspired. And even if I inspired just a few people, um, I feel like the work is being done and it's, you know, going to continue to grow and expand. And I'm just, so excited to know who I am and to be supported by, by those mm -hmm. around me in the work that I do. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you all said some things that are really interesting to me. And a big passion of mine is creating, uh, you know, I love, you all know I love this expression, the hug and slap, right? <laughs> you bring someone in and you're like giving them a little. Um, but it's interesting that we brought up hip hop and we talked about being young and, and, and some of the things that come at us, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. The you think of hip hop, and I think of Ram. Ram, uh -huh. Ram, yes, Ram. I get in trouble when I yeah, pronounce like, these things um, as rock. music of revolution, uh -huh, though, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Their communications of revolution. Even hip hop was mm -hmm. an, was a is kind of a Morse code mm -hmm. for people who weren't able to speak a language mm -hmm. that translated to them their their emotions, which is not allowed either, mm -hmm. and their feelings. And so, all three of you use multiple mediums in your day to day, and uh, you know, I feel like. I've ranted to you about this often that a big part of what's happening now is we lost music and art in schools in the, mm. you know, in the, in the, the mid sixties. Mm -hmm. I feel very intentionally because that freedom and that expansion of multiple mediums of communication do bridge, bridge worlds and bridge mm -hmm. gaps and give people an opportunity to share in the way that maybe they don't have words for or confidence mm -hmm. to, to, to lead through. So do you feel like that? Do you feel like you're not necessarily your careers, but kind of the the base note of your your heart is this playful creative experience that really brings people into a bigger understanding of themselves do you think so franklin i don't know i i, I think it's the bridge like you said um the art can bring us together can bring it, it can, and be another means of communicating for people to express themselves in a way that could be healthy for the planet um that that is kind of the the raison d'etre of being in the museum space. What's actually, the, word the the reason to be. I don't know why I said it in French, but oh, say you know. it again. It's good. It's good. <laughs> I just like that raison d'etre. It's, it's her. I think it's you like, too. Are, that. I, raison, I, I want to like, say it. You know, raison. it's like um, that other word that, that in German <laughs> there's no <laughs> other word for Gesamtkunstwerk. Oh, right. It just means the total artwork. Mm. Right. That's, Can you say that again? Gesamtkunstwerk, okay, mm. um, <laughs> but it, but it like total, yes, and total. and that yeah. so the museum represents I think a total art space. It allows us to talk about music. It allows for us to talk about fashion. It allows for us to talk about dance. Uh, we had a performance yesterday. I think before you performed, um, mm -hmm. seventy six year old amazing Afro Puerto Rican woman mm -hmm. uh, named Wilda Sterling who did a, a dance performance. But when you look at what she has on, 
you might as well have been looking at a painting. It was mm-hmm. just a painting that was moving. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I've always believed it to be that space that is flexible enough. Um, the foundation for me was in writing, it was in words, and probably because not feeling necessarily like how to express creativity, mm. right? Definitely like, not, not in my body, not in my, it's just, that's not me. It's not who I am. Um, you know, like this is more mm. comfortable. Um, mm. So that, that was the kind of um, genesis. And I think the, the, the guiding light is though where you, the direction that you're um, pointing in um, is that it is a, a space of education. Uh, the best thing we have here, we have this thing called Pam Teen Arts Council. Mm. And every year it's um, 14, 15 kids who are in high school who are artists or maybe not even artists. They might be just trying to find their own form of creativity. They might just like telling people what they think about the art that's on view, you know, which are basically budding curators. Right. Mm. Um, that's the, I think that's one of the best things we do. And I said, we have 90% of what we do is that. Like we employ t- almost 20 teaching artists. So. It is the, it, it, that is really the sense. I think, you know, you, you can talk about a great painting and that gets um, headlines, but what we're really trying to do is education and mm-hmm. process, of, process of education. Um, also feeling like, like I didn't go to graduate school. There was, it, it's, it's been about a school of learning mm-hmm. and the value in that in actually doing. Um, you mentioned travel before. I think that was an important aspect for everything that we, do as a foundation what about you jason i mean you coming from music and being also loving music and being a manager and a producer and a director do you feel that you're kind of creating a communication through your heart's passion yeah i think it's always been about um the language of of art and how it creates empathy because Mm -hmm. i grew up obviously black but watched benny hill (laughs) <laughs> SNL. I learned comedy through SNL. Mm. You know, I learned British humor through Benny Hill. I learned, you know, um, teenage humor through movies like Porky's and <laughs> Revenge of the Nerds. And, and, I, and I began to understand that there were different languages in all these movies that were communicating different things. And it gave me empathy for a mostly white experience. But I grew up yearning for the, the language and the communication of a black experience or an experience I was living. But, you know, Bingo Long and his Traveling All-Stars, Mahogany, um, Mm -hmm. all of those. And I was like, oh, here it is. But then it like, it would stop, but then it would start again and it'd be weird movies like, you know, where we're selling drugs and that's cool for a minute. And then after a few of those, you're like, isn't there anything else? Mm -hmm. And um, so I kind of grew up wanting to, and when I was of age, grew up wanting to be involved in stuff that I would have wanted to see as as a kid that's kind of my litmus test for for jumping into something right um be it be it educational or just pure entertainment but most of it is really educational for me mm-hmm. <laughs> um, i didn't really know who nina simone was again you know um until i was on tour with lauren and mm-hmm. we were in paris and this woman we got wheeled in the back of uh of the stage and started screaming at people and everybody started running and Lauren's mother started crying. And I was like, okay. And that's when I like my antennas went up and I was like, what's going on? Did she say something to you? And she was like, that's, that's, Nina Simone. that's it was all the clamp. And I was like, who's Nina Simone? And she looked at me like Jason. And she, she had to educate me. And then, you know, I met her again and who knew 15, 18 yeah, years great. later, her daughter would call and say, Hey, I'm trying to tell a story about my mother, and and I was like, yeah, of course. Um, so it's 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 this language to communicate our our brilliance, our flaws, our it's honestly it's language to communicate that we're just as brilliant and flawed as anyone mm. else mm. in the hue in the spectrum of color. Um, we're no better. We're no worse. We do some things better, we do some things worse, worse but there's uh, empathy, just understanding what's going on with us. That's really what's at the heart of it for mm. me. And, um, and I think that's the only reason why I'm courageous in anything that I do and I'm not scared to pick up something I haven't done before because I'm like, if, if it's coming to me 
and I haven't seen it before, mm. then it's here for a reason. Mm -hmm. So let me just tighten my belt and like, you know, listen really closely and, and learn something, but push forward with the spirit of I'm trying, I'm, everyone needs to learn something about this person or this art form or, or this whatever. And it, um, and it's always, it's always worked out. It's always worked out for, for better or for worse. And now it definitely gets lean uh, in between it. Uh, and, you know, I turned, I turned 50 however long ago, three years ago. And, I, <laughs> and we had a big party at my buddy Jeff's place up in New Rochelle, ironically enough, right? And, uh, and there was this moment where I stopped and I looked around the room and I was just like, oh my God, who, who here can say I've slept on that couch at one point? And 90% of the people in the room <laughs> raced that. And I was just like, and that's it. And that's, those are the people that have been holding me when times got low and I didn't know where I was going to be living or, you know, stuff was happening. And it's, um, it's that, that's community for me. That's Starting what. five. That, that lean part, I'm sorry, <laughs> no, it just reminds apologize. me of something. It's yeah. like, because you hinted at it at the beginning about this, and I don't think about it now, but when you talk about risk-taking, the challenge, et cetera, mm. like, and I think about some of the things, like, I'll never forget, I, it must have been, like, mid-'90s, maybe. I was at uh, JFK, I think. Get, waiting to get on a flight to LA. I've probably been to LA maybe once or twice in my life at that point. I see this dude online. Um, we, we, we chat and it's time to get on board. And I see, we get on board. And Jay goes to the left and I go to the right. And I'm like, oh, all right, I see where we get off. Because <laughs> he was in first, of course. <laughs> and, and it's like the, your ability to come out of a commercial space and then to take the kind of risk that you've taken in terms of filmmaking yeah, and creativity right. is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. Like I never, I, I, I was always from that aspect of trying to cobble things together. Right. And so, you know, there's a certain amount of risk, I guess there is at stake. Like I'll never forget being, um, being in, in Italy, working in Italy and realizing that my job was coming to an end and I had applied for another gig and I did not get it. And it just sitting there like, yo, what in the world am I gonna do? I have nothing, mm -hmm. not a penny, no degree. <laughs> like, and, um, it, but there's always a way. And mm -hmm. think, thinking through that creatively and knowing that, and I think the only reason why we, we can speak from this place is that there's a faith in creativity and in your mm -hmm. own personal ability to create something that somebody else is going to hold valuable. Mm. Mm. 100%. Mm. Flash art. That was when you yeah. were writing for Flash Art. I remember that. We were like, why is Franklin in Europe <laughs> writing? When Frank went to, he went to Wesleyan for art history. Yeah. We were like, wow. I, I, we, I, I don't even think people, well, in our circle, knew that that was a, de a, a viable degree. We were like, art history. Wow, good luck, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and then years later, people are like, oh, you know Franklin Sermons? Like, I, you know, I walk into rooms now, and I, I love to say it. I'm like, do you guys know Franklin Sermons? And they're like, do you know Franklin yeah, Sermons? Yeah. Oh, my God. How do you know Franklin Sermons? I love that. I think it's so fun. But that, I mean, that was my next question, and I want to I wanna get to, to you now, but I want to add that on top. But you, you hit where I was going next about... Yes, we're all talking about how wonderful it is that we have these abilities and that we're excited about these, these passions and this understanding of all the range of art. But what are the limitations and, and how do you push through and who's there to catch you? You talked about tribe and family and support. I call it your starting five, your people, your, your advisory board. Mm. But, um, you know, there are a lot of times and I've lived through, not so much with you, Franklin, but you mm. have, but with you two, well, we've all had a lot of really hard times just betting on ourselves again and bringing mm -hmm. that back to ourselves. So, mm -hmm. you know, I even think of you coming out of school, you, you had a dual major uh, and, and jazz, uh, jazz. Music therapy. Music therapy. Mm -hmm. And it was a psychology minor, mm -hmm. but. Um, mm -hmm. And then coincidentally, I'm in the hospital for a surgery. Mm -hmm. They tell me that there's a, there's a music therapy program and it's you. Yeah, I showed up to her what? hospital bed was, with I had my no, guitar. And I was like, great. I couldn't you didn't speak. Know what was no, uh -uh. We didn't know, I didn't know who was coming either. I thought I was going to do some research because then I could go back and tell her because I knew she had that wow. degree. Yeah. And I, 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 I couldn't speak because it was my, my yeah. voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was wild. But so 
How do you deal with all that? Yeah, um, I mean, it's um, a lifelong process. I think, like coming back to self, we, you know, we veer off sometimes, and then we have to, you know, remember who we are. Hmm. Um, and you know, everything I think happens for a reason. So when we meet those challenges, I think it's good for character building. Um, I, I did study music therapy, and I, I don't. It's funny, I don't practice it um like technically i don't have an office but i do believe that the work that i do is therapeutic for sure um and healing um so i i did i did my um my residency at uh, beth israel hospital and i did it in the nicu um so learning about how sound can regulate um the human body just mm. is yeah. it was a, a fascinating um experience and i i i traveled um through the hospital and worked with all the different um you know all the different kinds of patients but the nicu was my my place and i guess i was there for it was for pain right or for relaxation and um yeah it's you know no coincidences i yeah. believe yeah. um and I, uh, you know, I worked um, in a, and I worked in hospitality for some time also, where I was a maitre d', another French word. <laughs> um, and uh, that really helps me with my events that I um, do now. So I'm very, you know, like, I also worked for a concierge company mm -hmm. um, that was London based, but they had an office in New York. And um, all of those places that I had to go, you know, for survival, um, have really shaped the, you know, it, they added to my like you know my bag of of um, tricks of gems or yes of of tricks um, and they've all sort of like helped me with um, sort of where I'm going now um, and I think it's just like I really like to tell myself like remember who you are like all the time like whenever I feel like I'm mm -hmm. sort of like going a little too left or too right or I, I need to just like um, remind myself and it's, it's doing the things that you know the little things like how you encourage um, during your like um, activations I'll say um, you know like when you paint like what comes what mm. comes to mind like what's the first thing that you want to doodle um, those are the those, those little things that I feel like are reminders of our essence and um, yeah well, we're we're all parents here, mm -hmm. right? Whether we're parents of no, we are. I, <laughs> I don't. I I want to. I like to broaden. No, I like to broaden the concept of parents because mm -hmm. when you're birthing anything, it's your baby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you're putting your full heart in something and your full passion, and it's your baby. Mm -hmm. And so when you have something, whether it's a, a an idea, a business, a concept, a piece of art, a human, there is a, a, an idea that you want to impart things to them that you want to infuse in, in them and. You know, I've seen with my family and my friends, now that I'm 53, I can see people's big part of their life cycle, the people that come in really ready to just be in their own truth and the ones who are really wanting to follow the, the, the rules. So how do you inspire yourselves to stay inspiring to people who maybe can't access that? And is that a part of your day to day, realizing that every interaction and every connection with another person is a potential inspiration for their own unfolding? And is that a part of your day to day? How do you lean into that? Is that a practice of, of self? I know for me, hmm. I have to do a lot of things every morning to stay really in my heart because I'm in complete dedicated service to learning it more and growing it more. And knowing that I'm the chief energy officer of my life, I want to mm -hmm. make sure that I'm bringing that energy to other people. Mm -hmm. It really starts with me doing that work. So do any, what are your practices? How do you feel about that? Do you feel that intentional when you're impacting other people? Mm. Um, I mean, your job alone in life is full and you also it's have a family. That, yeah. So there's a lot of interaction with others that we all have. So I'd love to hear. Um, yeah. I mean, even the, uh, some of the threads of that was doing a career you'd never, you've seen someone never have before. Yeah. So we do things in our own world where we really inspire the people to open up further. Do you see that as intentional? Do you I see think that? it's changed. I think it's changed for me over mm -hmm. time. Um, when I was younger, I had this thing similar to your starting five that I call the coalition of the willing, you like find, find, find people that want to do the same thing as you and like, just click up and like, get through it. But I find as I get older now that um, anytime someone like douses, throws a little bit of doubt on that dream or that idea, it, it just hits different now. 
it used to hit like I don't know, but as you as you get older and, and maybe this is me coming into my own space of, mm. of understanding or acknowledging that I'm an artist because mm. I've been working in service to artists and art for such a long time and I'm now mm. stepping into that space of being one and I'm way more fragile mm. than I thought I was I as a creator so much more fragile and I'm mm. like oh I can't talk to too many people about what I'm doing I gotta hold this myself and I've got to do all the heavy lifting and get out there mm. and push and, and and build the frame if you will mm. and find people that might want to help me you know put the the insulation in and do all of the other stuff but uh, so I'm I'm going a little more inward now which I guess makes sense if I'm taking on an artistic endeavor but I think that's an inspiration too yeah. you know I feel like if even making a practice of your life of of having something that's your baby that's mm. really what I was saying there's practices and rituals around that. Mm. And, and I, I feel like a lot of creative people say that, that anyone who pioneers anyone, it's, a, it's such a fine line to insanity because only you can see it. Mm. So it really does take a practice and a life experience of like, I'm going to hold this here mm -hmm. until it's formed enough that you can experience it as my intention. With other people, yeah. And, and so I love that too. And I think that's something you're teaching because you, you live a, a very outward world. And mm -hmm. to show people that I'm going to pull something in because mm. I believe in it that much mm. is, I, I feel like, a big part of that, mm. connecting to people and giving them uh, inspiration in that way. Mm. And, and I also think that you, you really have a gift of seeing people's gifts. Mm -hmm. And so I can imagine that even in your just day-to-day -day conversations, you're giving people some inspiration and some gems of, of the next step on their own path. Yeah, it's helpful for me, actually. Yeah. What What is the expression? What What you What heals you, or what you know? What you teach teaches, or what you What's the expression? There's a famous mm. expression. What you're teaching teaches you. That's what it is. Mm. What you're mm. teaching teaches you. Mm. Yeah, I think that. Um, well, remind me what the how what the what just that the, the fact that we oh. you are we're inspiring the people, right? Mm. We've hit these oh, limitations and, and yeah, rituals, yes. mm -hmm. um, sorry, no, I, I, um, I did the same. <laughs> I have work to do in that regard. <laughs> I <real>. do. <laughs> I um I really always admire your daily rituals. You are the queen of setting yourself up for success every day and um I need to you know, I need to be more intentional with that. I think I have, my children are small, as you know, so it's like, I, I think it, that's my excuse <laughs> right now. <laughs> that's my current excuse. Um, it's hard. Um, but I, I would like to carve out um, some more time to ground myself in the morning. But for me, um, how I uh, like check in with myself is if I'm like not moving a lot, if I'm not dancing, then I know like I'm not, um, I'm not operating in my highest uh, like capacity. I have to be able to dance, you know, and and there'll be times where I'm I don't dance for a long time. And then like when I do again and I tap back in, then I'm like, "Oh, there she is," you know, like, "Hello. <laughs> Good to see you again." Um and I and I feel that like with what you were saying about whether it's intentional or not when we're inspiring people, I I feel like it's just subconscious. Like sometimes I don't even realize the impact or the reach um, that some of the work that I've done or, or I'm doing um, until, you know, it's concrete and, and in my face and someone like tells me mm -hmm. um, directly, I just am, you know, and then it, it sort of, the work is being done, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I also, I just want to, I, I beg to differ too. I feel like, I, I, yes, you have young children. That's very complicated, <laughs> but you're such an inspiration to me in that I find a lot of people have children and then want to get back into their real life, right? They want to mm -hmm. like, okay, we got the kids, they're here. Now I'm going to get back here. Mm -hmm. And as I've watched you as a mother, which is fascinating, you know, to see you in this way. And you really are in the practice of playing and learning and, and exploring with them. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. do that in such a, um, in real service to whoever they are blossoming into being. Mm -hmm. That is something that if we could, as parents of even employees and communities could do yeah. that we'd have a different life because mm -hmm. we you know as, as people who, who look into safety and lean into our brains we want to impart this wisdom that often is the the demise mm. you know I, I love to make the joke oh you got into columbia university and as your mom i'll say you know you're not really cut out for a big city 
And we do these things that we think are safety, <laughs> but we're really smalling each other. Yeah. And, we're, we're, and, you know, Ooh. children zero to seven have no analytical mind. Mm. So whatever you tell them, they believe it. They're mm. in it. It's their reality. And I feel like I hear you. Yes, maybe more everyday dancing. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's such a beautiful thing. And it was interesting to also lean into realizing because you don't have this American concept of parenting, mm-hmm. you lean into this much more global idea that you're in this new experience together Mm -hmm. and it's all first-time parents or amateurs Mm. that's the only way to do it Mm. thank you for that acknowledgement i I, I receive that i I see it in them too yeah Mm. i love that Mm. thank you there's a space of ritual that i know if i am attentive to it and allow that to be part of my everyday then i know i'm be able to give more and to be more um in the moment and be super present with people if I get that. So the two ways that I have gotten that is that uh, I do play a lot of tennis and that's the balancing part. <laughs> and some of the, the people I play with were out here at the party the other night <laughs> and you know, with Linda and them mm-hmm. actually. Um, and without them, I know I'm not, I don't function the way that, <laughs> that, that Franklin needs to function mm-hmm. without them. So last Saturday, that's where I was. I was playing doubles with these dudes. Um, so there's that. And part of that is the second thing that I, that I wanted to bring up in, in terms of what you said was that, um, and it's funny, you, you say you know, maybe you're not cut out for the big city. So I'm from New York originally, right? But my whole um, career life has been outside of New York in Houston, Los Angeles, and here. And obviously those three places, there are some things in common, but some things not. But what they do allow for me to do is to have a different kind of um, work life balance Mm. in order to be as present as I can be. I know I'm not the same person in New York. Well, I'm just, I'm just not. I just overstand. No. Yeah. I overstand. I'm in New York. I'm like, okay, 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 okay. And then I'm not doing anything I need to get it's done. Different. It's just, it's hard, you know, when you come from a place. I know that that mm-hmm. I know that all three of you have a short on time. So I'm going to get to some fun items. This is you know, all fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I want you to say? This is all fun. I mean, yeah, no, I'm do having some, Come on. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. I'm having, so, um, when I was writing this book, I, I don't know, I think I judged myself, as you, as Riva said perfectly before, about being, I'd love to say, mixed before it was trendy, a single mom before it was trendy, <laughs> you know, all these things. And um, so I, it was getting to know myself, was looking at the things that I love that have shaped me, movies and references and experiences. And you talked about a few, but I'd love to hear if each of you were a pizza pie and you were going to split it up for all, everyone in this room to eat. <laughs> what are the things that are in that pie that really make up who you are today in, in terms of what you've absorbed um, from the things around you? <laughs> I'm going to draw my pie as I think of my answer. Oh, wow. That's a good one. <laughs> Anybody wants to jump in there first? Uh, film. Film is, uh, for me, is a big part of it because artists make films uh, and all kinds of artists, commercial artists, weird artists, independent artists, quirky artists, um, artists with resources, artists who don't have resources. And to make a film, you got to really want to have something to say. It became a language for me uh, early on in can referencing. You, can you give us the top six of those films that when they hit your heart, you said, this is where I'm, I'm going to ride this train? Yeah, Scarface. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> certainly uh, the Godfather series were huge. Um, it, I didn't come from a big family, um, so it wasn't like... Family, 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 and I, mm-hmm. and I, I learned, I, I learned, I, I began to empathize with people from big families by watching that and how um, families' uh, projection upon what you should be or shouldn't be, how how impactful that can be. I never had that. My parents didn't want me to be anything, so I loved watching stuff like that um, for silliness and fun and joy. Just those crazy movies from the eighties that were like about high school kids getting into trouble from risky business to again, Porky's, Revenge of the Nerd, like all of that just silly, silly, silly stuff. Airplane is still one of the most impactful (laughs) movies in my life. Just the shit. I speak jive. They made fun of everyone. They did. And just, they made fun of fun. Yes. And um, they made fun of Harry Christmas. They they made fun of the seriousness of pilots. And it just... It let me know that like, oh, you can laugh at things that mm. are true. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. I could laugh at myself, laughing at Jive and what, what all of that meant. Um, 
and and obviously uh, important TV shows. Like I never understood All in the Family, and then shout out to Norman Lear who died mm -hmm. recently. I never understood All in the Family until I got older, and I was like, oh, they were breaking down really tough issues mm -hmm. in a in a fun way. I thought he was serious. I didn't know it was satire. Yeah. So I was angry a lot of the time watching it, but then I got older and I realized like, oh, this is satire. This is how you actually approach tough things. And I see that today in animation mm -hmm. with what uh, Seth MacFarlane does with mm -hmm. Family Guy or, or any of that weird stuff. They take on really tough issues, but it's cartoon drawn characters. So you hear it differently. You almost hear the absurdity of it in, in a lot of ways. So that um, music, um, which, you know, Frank and I come from the same backgrounds, and so do you, Grace. I mean, we, we were listening to um, New Order and Depeche Mode and mm -hmm. The Smiths in, in the same mixtapes as Public Enemy and KRS-One and mm -hmm. just the, the breadth of that. And then going to all of those shows in the city, which is one great reason to be in New York um, or Europe, for that matter, is you get to see all of that stuff like relatively cheap you see it before it becomes big so you get the culture of the music mm -hmm. as opposed to the presentation of the of the big thing um and and really which may not be a popular thing but growing up around diverse um cultures mm -hmm. you know growing up with racist italians as well as <laughs> racist irish as well as racist all of them racist black folks racist all of it and you're just like you shout get the absurdity <laughs> shout, out, shout out to racist black folks you get you see the absurdity of racism in its entirety mm. i like to say that era that um that we came up in which is 80s and we graduated in 87 right yeah. um is like three things seem to unite all of our worlds music because hip-hop was coming of age mm -hmm. sports mm -hmm. because when you're mm -hmm. on a sports field yeah. It doesn't matter what color you are. Either you get your job done or you don't. And shout out to Frank and New Rochelle High School, <laughs> state champions in 87. Um, and, then, um, and then weed. Everybody was like, you, wasn't were weed, you were weed curious <laughs> or you were high or you were whatever. But Something. Everyone, you were just around it. And like, even if you didn't do it, you were like, are they having more fun than me? And so people were just <laughs> like, and it united people. Guys from the projects would come to parties mm -hmm. we had in the North End and be like, you you had a blunt before, yeah, and yeah. and the white cats would be like, oh, they'd be the "What's most a blunt?" Like, right. And they'd be like, "Have you had a bong <laughs> so hit?" And it, you just saw it happening all right there. So, it, any 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 kind of uh, any kind of, of of entertainment that 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 speaks to a specificity of culture that then you could take that specificity and get empathy from it and uh, some understanding around mm -hmm. it, but then. But then enlarging it to like, well, what's specific about your thing that they're going to get yes. and understand? And that's where this confluence begins to happen. And it gets really weird and fun. I love that. Yeah. Yes. There was something that, that you said earlier um, about, well, something that's all of you said that, that I wanted to speak about, uh, particularly when times get hard. Um, I'm li I was listening to your story, which I never heard before. You had you were always going to be what you were going to be. Mm. You were born in Haiti and then decided to go to music school in New, New Orleans. Orleans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your yeah. your path was laid out. You, you just thankfully you listened. Yes. Like you were open enough to be like, "Oh, let me do this, let me do that." Mm -hmm. And I look I look back at the experiences I had and I was like, "What else was I going to be doing?" Mm -hmm. the, it it was all right there and I think I think the um the courage really is yeah. is softening enough to just hear, mm. to just hear that thing inside that's like, you don't want to go to law school even though I applied. Mm. Um, you don't want to med go to med school because you can't. You don't want to be, you know, what what people think you should be. No, you should work for free for a couple of years in the music business. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Everyone else is going to grad school or doing something amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sucks. You're living under someone's roof. You're making 250 bucks every two weeks. But it's going to work out for you. Like whatever that voice was that that drove me to do it because it felt it felt comfortable. It felt like it made sense for me. Maybe not for other people, but for me. So yeah, mm. I think we all had similar experiences. That was like, no, no, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And now mm. that you look back at it, you're like, how of how like the fact that I don't know music or didn't know enough black history really mm -hmm. was so advantageous to me when it came time to experience things for the mm -hmm. first time because yeah. I had what some call beginner's mind or 
you know, what does I say? God protects fools and babies. I've, I've been <laughs> both most of my life. So however, however that works, it just gives you an openness to receive things as opposed to categorizing them from what you may know in, in, in your own mind. That's so, very yeah. true because it's that Spot wanting on. other people to validate gold star and condone the thing is what makes people not have the courage. Correct. Back to the French word, right? Cur. So it's like <laughs> bravery to tell the truth of your own heart is really what courage is. Mm. And mm. so that this is the concept of this conversation, the fiction of limitation, mm. because limitation is a fiction. Absolutely. But if you buy into that story, it's debilitating. Yeah. And you three are my heroes of not buying into that story, but it's not an easy thing for most people. Yeah. It's really the one step in front, you know, Deirdre and I have been following this Al-Anon group and we can hear over and over that the big issues, biggest issue is not that people don't believe they're pioneers or believe they have something magical, but they don't feel safe enough to stray, stray away from the pack mm. to trust themselves to have it. Um, so that's a really big, that courage. I'm glad you brought that up. Mm. What's your pie, Franklin? Oof, I mean, <laughs> I was, like that this. was pretty spot on. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, um, yeah, it's, it's that, that diversity of experience that trying to find the place where things don't make sense <laughs> and having a belief in that 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 is the place of some degree of power, some mm. degree of creating something valuable. Right. Um, it's the path is just, I guess in some ways it can be inscribed, but it's about the voices you listen to. Mm. Um, and that's, and, and I just, I've been mean, fortunate. I mean, you, you know, you touch on the people around you. I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's like, I may not have been in the music business, but I went to school with this guy and went to, grade school with DJ Stretch Armstrong. And then I went to college with his friend Bobito. <laughs> and then we were in school with Brand Nubian. And there's a faith in the, in the unknown and in the places where you're a little bit uncomfortable as well. Mm. And, and feeling from a very early point that it's okay to be a little bit uncomfortable. When I went to Italy, I didn't not speak Italian. I, they were like, I was like, what kind of insurance you got? They were like, don't, don't worry about that. We take care of you. <laughs> got the cash under the table every month. You know, this space of just saying, it's going to be all right. Yeah. You know, you have a, a guiding light in some fashion. Mm. And, and so much of that is based in spirituality and not being necessarily a part of a church or a given mm. space mm. all the time, but always knowing and believing very strongly in a degree of spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the kind of kind of things. Just just thinking about that. Um, I mean, Jay, Jay touched on like the 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 when you when you're listening to the Smiths and it segues into like if you think of denialism that that we listen to now a lot or that we hear a lot in terms of where hip hop is coming from, it's a different kind of nihilism than than I think mm -hmm. that more punk inflected, mm -hmm. um, somewhat internal liberatory struggle. Um, so I'm trying to, I don't know, I'm trying to find the space between those things, but being open to that is because of the foundation that was set mm -hmm. very early on. Um, you know, I just, yeah, I feel, I feel blessed for the people out around me that. Wow. That's a, that's a crazy chances. similarity you just drew in the nihilism. Like it's crazy. Yo. Like we, we, we listen to, we listen to punk or, 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 or whatever alternative. And they were just talking about like, Drinking and killing themselves. <laughs> themselves. The greatest <laughs> authors in American history were all drunks. To, and some of them did kill themselves. Exactly. And and we have the nerve to sit and listen to young young men of color and, and whatever yeah. these environments they come from talk about getting drunk and high and killing themselves Basically. and act like, oh my God, how could they say that? It's yeah. that's I mean, that's a part of art, isn't it? Like Art, artists are always questioning whether they're doing the right thing or not. Mm. And sometimes that voice gets so loud, it literally mm. drives them crazy. I didn't understand art until, like seriously, mm. didn't understand it, until on a trip to Amsterdam, I went to the Van Gogh Museum mm -hmm. and I read his story and I was like, yo, I'm done. <laughs> this dude's brother did what? He paid for everything? And then the wife was there just like, fine, fine. Move to the city, move to the country, move back to this, like, and then he died? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, it blew, and that's when I was, I, I never understood the story of art. It's about the artist behind it mm -hmm. and like what pushes them to that. And I, I was forever changed just from reading his story. Mm -hmm. Forever changed. Story. So yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, that that's many conversations. 
friends. Because yeah, yeah, in yeah. that conversation, the concept, I, I always, I love to quote Neil Brennan, the comedian, mm-hmm. because he says that the only time black men are allowed to be sad in public is when they have a saxophone. And I think there really is a concept, and it also ties back into what Nye was saying about, you know, the significance of where Haiti is and how they used a spiritual form to kind of create a massive change that they will forever be punished for. Mm -hmm. And Mm. so I think that, you know, one of my favorite groups as teenagers was the Suicidal Tendencies. Mm. They had no flack from that name. And so so that's a whole thing in itself. Um, But can you tell the people who are six what nihilism means, please? I don't know how how you say um, falling prey to defeat personally and collectively. Mm -hmm. I think the problem Mm -hmm. with now is that it's so collective. Right? Mm. When you listen to 21 Savage, it's collective. It's mm. not just about him. Right, right, right. It's mm. not all of us, unfortunately. Mm. It's the opposite of everything that we're talking about. Right. It's mm. leaning into no the, hope. There's, right. there's nothing. Mm. And we know that's not true, but yeah. It's a, it becomes a, per, a, a, a pervasive feeling, especially when you are a pioneer of anything. Right. I, mean, I went to the first time the Socrata Familia and stood there and cried because I understood the story that his family couldn't understand his dream for this architect, this architectural dream that has circles and right. no faces, and they put him in a mental institution right. for many, many years. And what a fine line that is. And if you don't have a starting vibe, a community, people who see you and hear you, I can see how that could quickly lean into nihilism because right. where mm-hmm. are you going to go with that gift? Mm-hmm. It's uh, uh, Noah Purifoy, um, the whole uh, aspect of this artist who, who was Los Angeles based and in the 1960s with what happened in terms of the Watts Rebellion, being a teaching artist at the Watts Towers, he saw so much in that period that he, he, he had to drop out and he moves out to the desert and spends the next 20 years of his life creating sculptures just for himself mm. into this desert kind of environment that one can experience now, but he could not take the the real the reality of 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 where um of where we were at that given point in time and i feel like a lot of people are going through that right now oh absolutely a hundred percent um as i was writing out my slices on my pie heartbreak was was one of them like Mm. i feel like um ever since a very young age like i've always like carried this like old woman's heartbreak (laughs) i'm this like sad old woman like um there's a story that you always tell new jersey at keisha sutton's house and we go to the supermarket to get some food and i had night i always had i was four i wasn't born in haiti also i wanted like to say that because we're in the age of information she's inaccuracy i dragged her to every recording studio of the native tongues early days because i was babysitting all the time it was me in a front carrier people thought she was my kid and we were at every session Mm. but she's four years old and we're in the supermarket and i hear on the radio the swv song comes on um, week week (laughs) and i'm just like oh beautiful and then all of a sudden i hear some woman singing it like an old negro spiritual like (laughs) belting it out and i literally look all around and then i finally look down (laughs) and she is i mean she's she's holding her chest i was like something's going on in there yeah um and i i really leaned into a lot of um that music in high school i mean a lot of emo teenagers but like nina simone Mm. um billy holiday was like my go-to girl Mm. Um, Sarah Vaughn, you know, just really sad, <laughs> sad music. So I think that's a part of yes, me. 100%. Heritage is a big slice. Um, spirituality, music, of course, dance, art, and magic. Mm. And magic is, is, is a big one, um, you know, in any and everything. But just like I used to, you know, um, make potions out of like flowers and things that i would find and like be crushing <laughs> leaves like from really young and I, I i do that on a different scale now you know like creating mountain florida water or like space spray or making like a manifestation oil it's just like continuing to be that little kid um making things out of you know nature's gifts and mm. doing that now as an adult yeah i love it yeah well i love you all we're going to do the gift to the next off camera. But if there's anything that you feel inspired to say or share around this concept of of not letting limitations hold you back, of moving into your bigger dreams every second of your life and being the embodiment of that for all who don't have that ability, the capacity, the belief of the capacity that they have that mm-hmm. ability. 
I've always found that the bigger the resistance to the thing that you're doing, mm. the the bigger the opportunity for greatness around it. Mm. Beautiful. Ah, that's really good. Thank you for that. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, Deirdre, again, because she's staring at her, <laughs> said this thing to me the day that I just blew my mind and I've been sharing with everyone because, you know, I like to not, I like to check things off and get a gold star and keep moving. <laughs> and she was saying that when she became a black belt, she felt she was like, I did it. I'm at this place. And then her teacher said to her, great, now the work begins. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's a big issue mm-hmm. we're having with the mental health crisis now and that we have a generation, we were talking about this this morning with Terrence, about the younger generation really wants handouts. Mm-hmm. They really want things to be easier. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like our generation, specifically us, not you, we had it so rough, the first latchkey kids, and we mm-hmm. wanted our kids mm-hmm. to have a better experience. Mm-hmm. But what they missed in the heartbreak and the hard work and the trying and the workshopping and not having a concept was the belief that they could step out in faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I just, I find that that concept, and, and back to the fiction of limitation, marrying to me in the book, the rainbow of us, because it's knowing that I'm this and I'm this and I'm this and I'm this, and I'm this and all those things are my truth, and all those things are beautiful, and they weave into each other to make the you know the recipe of who I am. Is the fear is the greatest fear right now as everything yeah. else around us becomes more uncertain. Mm-hmm. So, any thoughts? You don't have to have any. I know we're just trying to milk every delicious <laughs> thing out of you all three. Yeah, just trying, just trying to to with a thirteen year old daughter trying to um to keep that flame alive, mm. and it's so hard, obviously. Mm. I used to have, I still do to some degree, an intense fear of heights at times. And the only reason I, I, I got over it, at least enough for skiing reasons, is because my daughter made me get on some rickety friggin' gondola and go all the way up. And it was absolutely nerve wracking the whole way, like sitting there like this the whole way and watching her just go. Doo, 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 doo. <laughs> but now, you know, that was 10 years ago and now we're eight years ago and now I see how the world tries to, to tries mm. to stifle the, the flames, mm. right? Tries to get you to conform conform to to certain aspects of who you are. And so um just trying to find a, a space in order to keep this kind of conversation um, a part of the everyday mm. and to keep that thing open. And that I think the easiest and best way is through television and film and through art and through experiences with books and experiences with music. It happens.